Hey everyone, this is Jack from the Cardboard Herald, and today we are taking a look at the new joint by Matthew Dunstan and Brett Gilbert, published by AEG, the Guild of Merchant Explorers. And because we're going to get into all of my thoughts, a great place to start is some context. So, as always, what is this game? Sale, sextants, cartography. In the Guild of Merchant Explorers, all players are given an identical map to respectively chart, hoping to become the most lucrative merchant, aka have the most points by the end of four eras. Each turn of an era, the top card of the Explorer deck is flipped and players all place Explorer cubes on their maps corresponding to the region types on the cards, desert, mountain, water, grass, or anything. Some of these have further restrictions, like three water being placed in a straight line, but the main restriction is explorers must either be placed adjacent to the capital in the center of the board, other explorers, or your villages that are created when you fully explore a landmass of a single region type. This is helpful because eras go quick, having only one of each type of exploration card in the deck, and at the end of each era, all of the explorer cubes are washed away, and you must start again from the capital or any now lingering villages you've managed to discover. But why? Whence? What rewards do you reap? Not only are three gold cards dealt out at the beginning of the game rewarding players for their completion, but littered throughout the map are areas that can be covered for money, ruins tiles that can be covered for treasure cards granting some sort of immediate or end game boon. Exploring to the different corners of the maps brings big points for impressive discovery tiles, or most importantly, there are cities throughout the land that, if connected, give you fat stacks, and while one has to be covered up in the process of collecting said fat stacks, having had its share of merchant route multipliers, the other city is still open for further connections, allowing for loads of strategic decisions. And you think, well, wait, that's it? That sounds kind of bland. The secret sauce comes down to each era shuffling in a special era card in addition to previous era cards already shuffled into the deck. And the first time an era card is revealed, players draw two investigate cards to choose from and slot it into the respective era slot on their board. Special powers that will then activate every time that era card is revealed. These not only create the divergent possibilities of each player, but have huge immediate and long-term ramifications for your game. You know, that tactical and strategic stuff us reviewers are always going on about. The combination of small but important decisions through a series of predictable cards mixed up with three eras of new special cards, giving you powers of your very own, and a fourth era card that activates one of your choice, makes for a very tight and very satisfying abstract game. So what's really cool about this game is that it's a mix of a lot of different genres and it executes on those different genres pretty dang well. I mean, it's got this whole flip and write vibe to it, but it's not a flip and write game by any means. There's just the simultaneous execution of play and you could divvy up the components with other people and play at a distance if you wanted to. And then it's also a push your luck game, even if it's also like a Euro territorial allocation sort of game. By push your luck, I mean that as you play, you're going to make investments into hopefully capitalizing on permanent infrastructure that you'll be able to play into further rounds, but there's a degree of risk involved in that. You know what cards are potentially coming up, but the order in which they're coming up it will really impact your execution on that. And so you can definitely make safer plays or you can make riskier plays. And because you're playing individual boards, it makes such a smooth transition to solo play. This is a game where solo play is very close to the actual experience of playing the multiplayer without any sort of automated opponent, though that is a criticism that you can levy at this game that there's such little amount of player interaction that you are, for the most part, kind of playing a solitaire experience. You know, granted, you're going to have that divergent blooming of the board, but 
you aren't going to be in contention with your opponents that much, except when it comes to the goals, which as you're playing solo, you must complete all three of the gold cards in order to be a, considered a winner. And then there's a certain point threshold depending on the difficulty level that you're playing. But as you play, as the era cards are revealed, you close off certain sections of those gold cards so that, that way you can actually capitalize on the points from them. You still need to complete them, but you will be less likely to be able to meet those point thresholds. So it's a, a nice little incentive for you to move forward, which is reflective of that only real sense of player interaction in the standard game, which is racing towards the goals. It's a meaningful bit of player interaction, but if you want a lot of player interaction in your game, this is definitely not going to give it to you. Now, presentation, as far as I'm concerned, is excellent. I love the aesthetic of this game. There's kind of a sepia tone to all of it in order to give it that, that sense of antiquity. You know, you're trying to capture the, the oeuvre of the age of sail, and there's a rustic quality to the colors, but it's also vibrant and, and really visually pleasing. And yeah, I do like the little wood cubes that are your explorers and the visual exchange as you go from one era to to the next, sweeping away the explorers but leaving the towns on the board. From a user standpoint, from a functionality standpoint, it is a little bit fiddly, and that's something that I imagine is going to be a pet peeve for some people. Me, with my big colossal hands manipulating these cubes, I do occasionally bump things, and woe be to anyone who ends up shifting their mat around because those things can really go sliding. So functionally, you are having a little bit of a sacrifice there, but aesthetically, visually, presentation-wise, I really adore the look of this game. Another highlight of T-Gome is the strides it takes to be familiar in experience but different in execution from game to game. Not only do the unique combinations of special powers that you cultivate add a surprising amount of variety, but the game comes with four different maps across eight double-sided player boards, and each of these maps have their own special features and set of six unique goals, creating new and interesting obstacles from game to game. To add to this, there's a simultaneously released micro expansion that adds two new maps with their own twists and goals, including an expando board tile and a frigid ice map, which is always particularly welcome for an Alaskan ice boy like myself. I don't know all the economics of board game manufacturing, but in older years, I might have seen this as a sinister exclusion, but the game feels completely fine on its own, and given the last two years of greatly increased manufacturing and shipping costs, it also seems like bonus content on the side while keeping the base game price down is a good compromise, and if you like what T-Gome is putting down on the table and want even more variety, chances are you'll dig the Queen's Special Orders micro expansion too. So overall, I was really impressed with this game. I have had so much fun playing it, and I don't say that lightly, but on the other hand, this is also a game that is completely within my wheelhouse. I love games where you have your own personal tableau that is just growing more and more expansive as a result of little micro decisions that you've made, but end up diverging based off of little but also very impactful powers that you have, and then seeing the results of that in a very beautiful and, and visually pleasing presentation. So it kind of feels like this is exactly in my wheelhouse. If you're someone who needs player interaction, then this is going to be an automatic strikeout for you. And if you're someone who's really bothered by fiddly or, or small components that have the, the temperance, the capability, the, the, the want, to shift around if you aren't too careful with them on the board, then also this is going to be a miss for you. But if you're like me and you like these things, it's kind of like they looked at all those things that I love on my channel and were like, yo, Jack loves frickin' cheeseburgers, so let's give him a frickin' cheeseburger. 
and maybe you want a cheeseburger too. And that is our review. But what are your cheeseburgers? What are the game types that are so distinctly up your alley that as soon as a game starts catering to those things, you're like, oh, this is so for me. Let us know in the comments below. And as always, thank you for supporting. Thank you for watching. Thanks for being awesome. This is a great community to take part in. I have been Jack for the Cardboard Herald.